going to get started. Um, I would like, I am thrilled to welcome you to our first CRCS symposium. And uh, for those of you who wonder, CRCS is pronounced circus. So we try to have a good and joyful time here. Um, so I want to start with just a couple remarks. So what does success for today look like? And so I want to give you a couple success metrics that you can be thinking about as you listen to our speakers, as you engage with them, and as you walk about during the breaks. So one metric of success is that um, all the people who are going to stumble in late feel bad that they stumbled in late. Um, because I apologize to our speakers in advance. This is the university, and they will in fact stumble in late. But number two, when we open it up to questions and answers, a lively engaged audience is one metric of success. The other metric is that when you leave the room, you're still talking to the person next to you about ideas that have been discussed. And that when we have breakout sections after lunch, you engage fully and we'll come together and report back. You actually have homework and deliverables for these breakout sections. And so we'll talk about those. Um, and perhaps most importantly, after this event is over, some of the people you've met and the topics that have come up continue to permeate your life in some way. And maybe you come back and visit with us. Maybe you send us email about interesting things. But ideally, you all become a broader part of what we call the circus community. Um, so that's my success metric for today. I'm thrilled to have everyone here. I was proofing the program and just got so excited as I read, like, talk after talk after talk. So I think we're in for a wonderful time. And I will get us started. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the newest members of our community. Uh, CS was fortunate enough to get a new dean of engineering and applied sciences this year. And so Frank Doyle is going to open the program with some brief remarks. Frank comes to us from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he was the dean for research. He's been at a couple places before that. He has a bachelor's from Princeton, a PhD from Caltech. And his own research has been instrumental in bridging between technology and medicine and healthcare and, and all sorts of interesting things. So it's exactly the kind of exemplar that we think about when we talk about computer science or technology having real societal impact. So please join me in welcoming Frank to our community and welcome him to our symposium. It's a real pleasure to be able to add my welcome to you here for this uh, very exciting and, and auspicious event today. Um, you know, I've been here about six, seven weeks, and, and probably the most exciting part of my job so far has been getting to know the place, getting to know the faculty, the students, the programs, the centers. This, okay, is that better? The centers, the institutes, um, and in that regard, certainly getting to know the folks here at the Center for Research on Computation and Society has been uh, a very exciting part. And this, this center really typifies things we do not only here in C's, but more broadly across the Harvard landscape, which is deeply interdisciplinary, boundaryless, um, working on big, compelling problems. And uh, let's face it, with uh, an acronym that can be pronounced CIRCUS, this has got to be a fun place to do research. So um, it's been really exciting getting to know this place. Uh, I understand this is the 10-year uh, anniversary, which really points to the fact that this was a very prescient and forward-thinking strategic initiative in its day. Uh, I probably don't have to tell this community, but uh, the world of computing, even 10 years ago, was very different than the one we know today. Um, just a couple of metrics if one thinks about um, smartphone usage. Less than 1% of the global population was using a smartphone 10 years ago. 700,000 smartphones sold in 2006. Uh, today, 25% of the population of the world has a smartphone. Over a billion smartphones sold last year. So things really have changed dramatically. Another indicator of this, uh, Google searches. If one goes back 10 years ago, uh, Google searches probably tallied. Uh, Alfred can correct me here if I don't have the numbers right, but maybe north of 100 billion a year. Uh, 10 years ago, and yesterday alone there were 5 billion searches on Google. So again, the dramatic and very dynamic landscape in computing here is a part of what this initiative is very well poised to address and think about in the, the broader sense of the um, societal impact of what's going on. So I, I think what's important to think about as we get... Yeah. <laughs> And I suspect in this audience it's more than 25%. But so, you know, as we think about 10 years, there's certainly a tendency to look back and reflect, and that's important. Uh, it's exciting to think about the accumulated knowledge and wisdom that has been generated by this group. 
I come from a field of endeavor called control and dynamic systems, and in that field, we look at trajectories. We're looking at where things are going. And I think for this community, and in particular for Circus, there's a very exciting trajectory in place if you think about not only where we are today, where you've come in 10 years, but the vector, the way you're headed for the next period of research, I think it's tremendously exciting. And that's why it's particularly fitting that we celebrate the accomplishments of the, the faculty of this program, the researchers, the collaborators, the alums who have come through this program. So in that regard, it's a really exciting program. I want to quote the faculty director, Margo, who um, in assuming the role of faculty director said, we're asking important questions about the role of technology in our society and how as researchers we can tackle technically challenging problems whose solutions can make the world a better place. I can think of no more noble, important purpose, and in that spirit, I wish you a very productive, compelling dialogue today in your workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Margo. Um, I'm really happy to be back, um, to be back here at Harvard and uh, to be back in an academic setting um, and to be able to dress like this uh, without worrying who I might run into. Uh, although I have to say one of the most important signs of transformation at the White House these days is that you will see technology people not wearing ties. Um, so that's a, that's a small indicator that, um, that the culture is, is starting to change. Uh, the big news in Washington this week was the visit from Pope Francis, uh, who pretty much uh, took all of the attention as well as blocking all of the traffic for about three days, um, to the extent that even the visit from the premier of China was overshadowed. Um, when the Pope spoke to Congress yesterday, he said something that could have been addressed to us here in this room today. Uh, here's what he said. He said, Put technology at the service of another kind of progress, one which is healthier, more human, more social, more integral. He went on to say, in this regard, I'm confident that America's outstanding academic and research institutions can make a vital contribution in the years ahead. That's more or less the mission that we're talking about here today, is, to how, is how we can put technology at the service of important social goals and the role that academic institutions can play in doing that. Uh, so I think the Pope was entirely right about that, and it serves pretty well as marching orders for us. Um, because really, we've now reached a point where the technology community is realizing the power that it has to shape the world. You hear a lot of it in some of the rhetoric out of Silicon Valley. Um, and it's now time for the technology community to start taking more responsibility for the things that we're building. Part of the story about how to, uh, how to reconcile the changes in technology with social goals, um, part of that fight takes place in government. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening inside the federal government right now, 
to bring, uh, uh, to bring technology into the policy discussion in a more complete way. Um, and, and one of the important turning points in this was the, uh, was the uh, situation with the healthcare.gov website. Now you might think that website development was not necessarily the route to, uh, to policy influence, but, but here's basically how it worked. So healthcare.gov, as you know, uh, the, the, the technology didn't work out too well. Uh, if you think about it, it was kind of uh, a bad idea in the first place to roll out this incredibly complicated um, site uh, to just turn it on one day at full scale without, uh, without iterating on features, without growing the, uh, um, the, the user base uh, in a more organic way, but nonetheless the decision was made to do that. Couple that with a bunch of uh, management issues that are endemic in government procurement and you get what you got. Okay, so there was a crisis, and one of the responses of the crisis was to bring in some very, very good uh, engineers from, from the industry um, and to put them to work 24-7 to try to fix this. And they did, um, surprisingly quickly, uh, actually set things right and get the healthcare.gov um, website and infrastructure working. All right, so after that happened, um, some important people took notice and said, we need to make sure this doesn't happen again, number one. Number two, uh, maybe it would be a good idea to bring people of this quality in before the disaster is released to the public and get them to work on attacking some of the hard problems um, in advance. Um, and number three, we need to figure out how to scale this so that it's not just one team, but that we can deploy multiple teams because we know we have all kinds of issues. And so that was the birth of kind of a new model of um, participation of technologists in government um, and organizations like the US Digital Service um, or uh, a group called 18F which is part of the, um, uh, uh, the GSA, the, the part of the government that provides general services to the rest. Those groups were formed, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, um, and by now we have um, getting close to 200 um, very good, very, very good engineers working in government, a kind of technology special forces if you will. Um, and this model has been very successful, has gotten a lot of attention, and they've, they've had a real impact. So that was chapter one of the story. Um, government recognized the value of technical talent for development and for operation of systems. But of course, that's not the whole story. The other part of the story is policy, making decisions about what government should be trying to do, um, both in technology and in other areas influenced by technology. So that's what's starting to happen now. I think we're reaching an inflection point in the way that at least this administration thinks about the role of technologists in government, um, where we're moving beyond technologists being involved in operations and development, and we're starting to see technologists getting involved in policymaking, being in the room when important decisions are being made, um, and to try to get technologists involved in policy decisions where technology really plays an important role. Um, and so I'm really optimistic that that will continue, and I dearly hope that it continues in the next administration. So we're working inside the government to try to uh, make better policy as, as our part of the job, and we hope that some of you will come and join us over time. Um, and if anyone has interest in uh, what the paths are to participate um, from inside government or, as, uh, uh, or to work more directly with government, uh, please talk to me afterward. For the rest of you, uh, we hope you'll be teammates in trying to build uh, this better uh, technologically enabled world. So what does this mean for computing and for computing research? Um, I guess I'd say a couple things. First of all, in thinking about how researchers and developers can contribute to making a better world, we need to avoid a trap that, we, that one sometimes see in, in uh, humanitarian aid. And that trap is the trap of building the thing that we want to build instead of the thing that the people we're trying to help actually need. Um, and and uh, what goes along with that is the error of building a system and then walking away instead of thinking about sustainability. Right? What we really need to do is understand what's needed for the people we're trying to serve. Um, and then how can we build something that's sustainable and that helps them and that empowers them to take control and to uh, exercise agency in deciding about, uh, about how things are going to go.
So there are a bunch of big challenges, I think, that, um, that computing researchers can uh, work on um, in this respect. Um, some big uh, social challenges that, um, that are really crying out for advanced computing research. Uh, and I want to point to uh, three of them in particular. The first one is around issues of fairness and justice in, in, in big data applications. Um, we see that machine learning is being used in more and more places and that more and more important decisions are being made um, based on analysis of data. Things like, um, uh, things like eligibility for certain kinds of aid, things like sentencing for people convicted of crimes or decisions about parole, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on, questions about things such as who gets a visa to enter the United States, who gets a visa to immigrate here, these decisions are mediated by technologies. Um, and one of the things that we learned even in the pre-technology age is that if you want to avoid an unfair outcome, it's not enough just to have good intentions, and it's not enough just to avoid taking a certain uh, characteristics of an individual into account. You need to think more deeply about how the system that you've constructed is functioning and about the different ways in which you can get an unfair outcome. So for example, um, there are a bunch of mechanisms which in big data systems can lead to unfair outcomes. One of them is selection bias. That is the idea that, um, that you may have more access to data, you may, ha may have more access to examples in your training set that come from certain populations or certain situations. And then you'll build, if you, if you train based on the training set like that, you will build a system that serves well those people who are well represented in the training set and may not serve those who are not represented. Uh, you can train based on a biased history. One of the things you often do is try to train a system, uh, a machine learning system, to behave like people have behaved before. We have all these examples of decisions made by people. Can we train a system that behaves like that? Well, that's a good idea if the, or that, that's the right idea if the decisions made by people before are the decisions we would have wanted. But if there's bias in the past behavior of those people, train on their behavior, uh, you might get a result that is, is unfair. And then finally, you have the hard trade-off that is at the core of a lot of the big data and discrimination issues which is what happens when you have, um, what happens when there is some characteristic or feature in the data that actually is predictive of the outcome and at the same time leads to a disparate impact on a disadvantaged group. Um, what, do you, what do you do then? And that is a hard social choice that needs to be made. But we as technology builders need to recognize that there is a choice there, that there is a trade-off there. And it's not enough to just to say we're going to use some purely mechanistic um, uh, objective function, which, uh, which is going to give us, um, which is going to maximize some measure of efficiency alone. That it's not a fair outcome, it's not the outcome we would want as a society, and it may not be an outcome that's sustainable politically or socially if, uh, if we uh, don't take into account the possibility of bias in the outcome. And so we need to think about how we can build machine learning algorithms, data-based methods that are robust and give good, efficient results, but also can take into account the kind of biases and uh, unequal outcomes that we worry about. Um, and of course, there is an active area of research there and one that I think is very important and in the long run will be critical to the acceptance of the use of big data throughout society. The second piece I want to talk about, the second big research challenge, is issues of accountability and control over complex systems. Uh, we have an example in the news just recently of uh, Volkswagen getting caught um, uh, apparently programming the engine control software in their cars to detect whether the system was, um, uh, was in an emissions test and to operate in a very low emissions mode during the test but out on the highway uh, to emit uh, perhaps 30 to 40 times the legal, legally allowed limit of, of pollutants. Um, that's obviously, uh, if true, something that, um, th that we can't accept. Um, but bear in mind that it took a long time to detect this, and uh, it might have been detected almost by accident. And now we have questions about whether others are uh, engaged in the same kind of behavior. And of course, there are persistent questions about things like voting systems, 
and all kinds of other systems that um, are supposed to behave in a certain way, but how do we as a public know that they actually are doing what they're supposed to do? How can we hold them accountable? In a previous generation, some of the things that are being done now by algorithms were done by buildings full of bureaucrats. And we have a fairly developed theory of how to hold buildings full of bureaucrats accountable. It doesn't work perfectly, but we understand about, um, we understand uh, uh, the importance of civil service laws to protect people from certain kinds of influence. We understand about conflict of interest. We understand about certain kinds of transparency requirements. We understand how to think about the construction of bureaucratic organizations to try to reduce dysfunction. And those things don't work perfectly, but we at least have a set of tools. We need to have and develop a similar kind of uh, sets of tools for uh, computational systems. And with computational systems, although there's a lot of fear, I think, of the big bad algorithm that we hear, that algorithms are somehow inherently unaccountable, um, I think we have an opportunity to do better and to be and have systems that are mediated by software be more accountable than a previous generation's human-mediated system could have been. Because after all, there is in principle more visibility into software, and we have a different set of tools um, involving proof and involving uses of cryptography and so on, which if we use them creatively, might allow us to get a higher degree of accountability in a system that is run by an algorithm, while still being able to protect some information which about the functioning of the system which legitimately needs to be kept secret. Lots of important decisions are being made by these algorithmic systems. Eligibility for aid, um, uh, visas to immigrate, and other sorts of things. Um, and it's important to be fair first, but it's equally important in designing a system that's carrying out a public trust to convince people that the system is fair. Because ultimately what matters is not just to get the right answer, but that the system have legitimacy, that people will accept that what it did is reasonable. And that is based on convincing skeptical members of the public that the system actually is doing the right thing. Um, and so that mindset shift from designing a system to be correct um, to designing a system that is convincing and has legitimacy is really important when we think about how to build public systems. And so that's another area where research um, can bring, I think, a lot of benefits. Uh, and th the last area where I think research has a lot to offer is in security, or as we call it in Washington, cyber. Um, this is really a social responsibility of our field. Um, because to be frank, there's a certain cowboy mentality that a lot of uh, programmers and uh, computer scientists have about the systems that we build. Let's go out there, let's hack something together, let's see what happens. And that's great when you're in the lab, right? That's how things get discovered. Experimentation is a good thing and we don't want to discourage it. But we also need to understand that um, once, you, once you get to a certain point, the experiment that we're doing is an experiment on our customers or our fellow citizens. And we need to think differently about how we do that. And we have a social responsibility to make sure that we're making responsible decisions. Um, there are, there's a lot of good reason to believe that um, the, uh, that the, the market for software and technology is operating now in a way that leads to systematic underinvestment in security. Um, and understanding what we can do about that, um, both as a matter of policy, but also as a matter of we as technologists taking responsibility for what we're producing. Uh, is an important thing. Researchers can do a lot to improve the tools that developers have available to them, um, to try to find ways of changing the game that is being played in, in, in the security space. People who operate systems feel like often they're playing a game that is um, fundamentally tilted in favor of the adversary, in favor of the attacker. And researchers, um, I think one of the most important goals for research in computer science nowadays is figuring out how we might be able to change that game. Whether it means software that is provably correct, whether it means finding ways to use um, more adaptive or, um, uh, or uh, AI-based approaches to defense, to, uh, to defending systems, we need to have a way of improving dramatically um, our ability to build systems that will stand up against attack. 
And that's another place where research can be really important. All right, so if you're a researcher who is interested in having social impact in your work, how do you think about, how does that change the, the way that you do research as an everyday in the lab computer science researcher? Um, well, I think the biggest uh, way that these social um, goals and policy questions can affect your research if you're um, an everyday computer science researcher is in how you pick the problems to work on. Um, you still want to be working on things that, uh, that use the toolkit that you have, that use your skills, questions that are difficult and challenging um, and whose solution is of intellectual value. But among those problems in front of you, uh, you can use uh, questions of policy and questions of social uh, desirability to decide which one to pick. Um, and, um, uh, and that would be the first piece of advice I would give you. The second piece of advice I would give you uh, practically about how to be an effective researcher in this space is to make an effort to translate your work for the public and for policymakers, to find your interface to government and decision makers. Um, and sometimes that means uh, writing uh, about what you did in a way that is more accessible and available to the public. Um, once you have written a paper about something that you think is of importance, write a two or three page summary that uh, anyone could read. Um, write a two page summary that your Uncle Herb in Cleveland would be able to understand not only what you did, but also why it's of interest to him. Um, and then send it to people and make sure that people see it. So it's going to take, I think, um, work from our field in com as computer scientists, um, and it's going to take a different way that we think about the value that our research um, provides and about the career paths that uh, we think of as successful in the field. But it's our responsibility to do this um, and to do it and to get started on it right away. Uh, one of the things that I think people in our field recognize more than everyone in the political field has recognized yet is that technology is a major source of power in the world today. Um, as Mark Andreessen famously said, software is eating the world. That almost everything now has software in it or is controlled by software or has important decisions about how it operates mediated or made by software. Um, if you look at major social challenges like energy and transportation, healthcare, education, and so on, all of these are being transformed in important ways by the arrival of technology. And the decisions about technology are influencing those areas of policy, and those areas of policy, I think you can't make good policy in these areas without really understanding the transform transformative power that technology is having. So this puts a lot of responsibility on us, almost uniquely among scientific and technical fields these days. Um, computer science is playing a role in the transformation of the most important things going on in the world. So those who build the, and this puts a responsibility on those who build the technology, on those who develop the next generations of technology as researchers, and on those who educate the next generation of practitioners, and that's all of us. This technology that we're working with doesn't just happen. The old model of technology policy which says technology has an impact and we want to figure out what that impact is and mitigate it. That's not going to work anymore. We need to think about how to build the technologies that um, actually are going to create a better world. Um, because as the Pope said, if we want to live in a better world, we have to build that world and we have to build the technologies that enable it. Thanks. I invite you to the floor, and when you, before you pose your question, please introduce yourself and tell us where you come from. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of thinking about the policy implications of big data, and obviously um, 
Um, questions of control and privacy are central to that. Um, the, and I point to a couple things, I guess, that are going on policy-wise um, right now. One is uh, a process around big data and policy that started um, in, um, uh, in the, in the uh, winter of 2014 that led to the issuance of, a, of the so-called big data report from the White House in May 2014. Um, and that reflects a sort of big think about the policy implications of big data, which is still going on. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, there are still streams of work that we have within the White House relating to big data and policy that, um, uh, that we hope will lead to changes in or improvements in the way that we deal with these, these things. Um, another big strand of this has to do with the relationship between those who gather data and end and users. And you can break that into two pieces. One piece is information being collected by government, and the other piece is information being collected by, um, by industry. Um, and there's active policy discussions about both of those. Um, on the industry side, the um, policy to this point has really been focused on questions of, um, of transparency and um, uh, uh, transparency and um, uh, and honesty from 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 companies. Um, that is, if a company is making promises to people about what they're going to collect and how they're going to use it and so on, they can be held accountable for that. The I. My previous stint in government, my first tour of duty back in 2011 was at the Federal Trade Commission. And one of the big things the FTC does is hold co companies accountable for the promises they make about data collection and use. Um, there's also responsibility to those who collect and hold the data to not lose it. Um, and that's an issue that obviously a lot of companies have had and the federal government has had as well. And there's some serious, um, uh, and there's some serious policy work being done right now within the government to improve the way the government holds and deals with, with, with the data that it holds. Um, you know, I think there's a really important lesson that was learned from the Office of Personnel Management uh, <laughs> breach. We certainly hope that doesn't happen again. Um, and so many people who work in government were personally affected by that, that, um, um, that I think you're going to see policy changes coming over um, the coming, uh, over the remaining, um, 68 weeks of the Obama administration over, uh, over that. Alfred. So, uh, Alfred Spector, um, two, two things. So, one is um, you did kind of bring up issues of uh, election bias, mm -hmm. but, and, but broadly, do we include the right cause and effect? Do we have the right idea here? Do we learn something and we just identify a fake story? Mm -hmm. My guess is that. Uh, it, you're absolutely right. This, it's, I think there's a very common mistake of uh, sprinkling some big data on a problem um, <laughs> without realizing that, you know, what our friends in the social sciences have understood for a long time, which is methodology is really hard. If you want to get a result that actually is valid and generalizable and that goes to causation, um, that's really hard to do, right? And so, um, I think as academics, there's a couple things we can do. One is people who are going to be specializing and working in the use of these, um, uh, in the use of these tools, um, you know, we need to give them a serious education and methodology and understanding what they're doing. We also need, I think, we, we, we really want to reach every student with a basic understanding of data and computing. Right? No student should get through Harvard or Princeton or any place or, or any other good university without learning about correlation and causation and having some instinct for why this is hard and how these things can go wrong. Um, so if we're up to me, um, I think that's, uh, that's something we would be striving to do. Um, the 
The question of you know, what happens out there in the world where in fact there are people who are operating in a hurry and, um, uh, and with uh, complicated incentives and so on, and often without the training that they wish they had. Uh, that's, I think, a harder question. Um, one of the things that we're thinking about in government is, um, is, is how to think about um, those areas where there is an established policy framework or established law that um, uh, requires non-discrimination or fairness in certain se senses. Um, and what responsibility there is under the current law or should be for people who are operating in those fields. I'm talking about areas like employment and access to credit and so on, where there's existing law and existing policy. Um, and we're trying to understand what, what is the right way of thinking about um, these issues there. Um, there are other areas where there's not specific sectoral regulation. And in those areas, I think, um, ultimately, this problem will, will be disciplined by two things. One is uh, people taking responsibility for the work they do. Uh, and the other one is the fact that a model that's unsound probably at the end of the day doesn't work and doesn't lead to su success or a, su or a sustainable business. Um, that is, we hope that the better methods, the ones that yield better, more accurate results, will actually win out in the end. But this is a big, and, a big question and one that we're certainly thinking about actively from a policy standpoint. Yes, thanks. Um, that, that's a huge question, right? It goes to the question of how we should govern ourselves as a people, right? And there's some existing theory on that question. Um, I, I would first refer you to that. Um, and certainly people in the room who are much better um, positioned to refer to that. Um, and I think the answer has to be that sort of all of the above, some of all of the above, I think the people who are building the system need to be thinking about what they're doing. Um, and it is, even if you are entirely amoral with respect to the questions of fairness, even if you don't care at all about it, uh, you know, even a person who hypothetically doesn't care at all about it, just want to build a system that's most efficient by some measure that doesn't include fairness, um, even they will have to consider the implications of the legal implications, the reputational implications, um, the policy implications of what they're doing. Because I think a system that is deeply unfair is, uh, even if it's legal, not sustainable. And the changes will happen. A lot of how, and, and this is actually one of the things that um, I was a little slow to recognize when I first started working in policy, and I think a lot of computer scientists are slow to recognize, is that the political system and governance doesn't work just by having fixed laws and asking people to um, abide by them. It works by adjusting. And when there is a behavior that is um, allowed but seems bad, that the political system and the policy system will change the rules to try to, um, to, try to steer it in a different direction. Um, and and um, I think we see again and again people who are fixated on the purely technical, purely efficiency issues in this technology getting burned by this, by doing something which um, doesn't account for um, social values that, um, that the, the public expects to be um, part of the equation. And um, just building a system that's efficient in some sense and then being surprised or feeling burned when the rules get changed. Um, so, I mean, I think it's up to everybody. These problems are really hard. <laughs>
Uh, but I do think that we need to think uh, that if you're trying to build a business in this area that, um, or, you're trying to build, um, uh, or you're trying to build a sustainable structure, you need to think about these things. Um, and you ought to in any case. Again, I won't read you the bio, instead I'll share a little personal, personal anecdote about our next speaker. So um, many years ago, I was trying to get someone to come and teach a course at Harvard, and what I explained to them was, look, you're going to teach a course of several hundred students, and most of them won't be computer scientists, but they will, in fact, go on to shape the world in important ways, and you get to tell them how to think about technology. So. Um, Chris Yu is one of our former undergraduates who studied computer science here and then went on to study law and is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the intersection of technology and law. So putting his Harvard undergraduate education to fabulous <coughs> use in the service of society. It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Yu. Well, thank you very much. And it's, um, thank you. So it is, uh, it is interesting to be in the space. I am a bit of a, an unusual interloper in the sense that my primary appointment is in law. I hold a secondary appointment in computer science and I teach and I co-teach classes with computer science professors. And I think the position I come from really is, uh, shows my commitments and my beliefs that this is a, a gulf we need to bridge. And what's been striking to me is um, business people have increasingly understood that they need to understand technology better. And it's not just in the here and now what the technology gives them in terms of business opportunities, but they're starting to realize that particularly architectural commitments determine the capabilities of what a technology can do. And things like interface design and how you actually structure an architecture have very long-term business implications. And I have some work looking at abstracting from um, modularity theory and system theory, hidden information to try to understand that better. And I think that that's starting to move along. What's striking to me is legal people are starting to understand they need to, under, uh, to uh, decide how to work technology. Uh, I see Yokai is here. He's going to talk at some point about network neutrality. Um, it's a debate I've been involved in. Setting aside the merits of that debate, um, it's interesting. One of the central issues in network neutrality is how you manage congestion. If you talk to legal decision makers and policy makers with a very simple question, it's like, well, you do understand how congestion is managed on the internet. You know, thinking back to the Jacobson algorithm that's been established for 30 some years, um, none of them know what it is. And there are many ways to make policy. Ignorance is not my preferred method. And that, in fact, that's just an established baseline for having an intelligent conversation about how this works that just isn't present in the background. So I was fully convinced uh, that we need to get policy people more teched up. What's been very, very interesting to me is um, the technology community is growing uh, more aware that they need to be uh, more tuned to interests about uh, economics and uh, law. And I think this is more obvious to the privacy and security community than most. In fact, in most branches of engineering, you can clear out the whole room by starting to talk about whether it's constitutional or talking about money. And I think that uh, technologists are realizing uh, that this has got to change, not just because they're tired of losing their businesses and their startups to people who didn't have anything to do with creating them, but for the reasons that Ed's starting to talk about, which is there's important things at stake here and there's some choices that we have to make. And so I have um, really uh, staked sort of the main thrust of what I'm doing right now to this idea that, in fact, there needs to be a dialogue. And in fact, in this audience, my task is to convince you that you need to understand something more about law. And in fact, uh, my hope to do that is through the topic I have. This is uh, related to an NSF grant that I'm working on right now about cyber physical systems, how to implement privacy and security in those systems, and to see how they work. Now, um, this is actually, for all the academics in the room, is something that I think will be very important. But it's not just because the NSF is now using this as a grant criterion, but in fact, we sh as a society should be very concerned about the fact that the NSF has funded all this research and it remains sitting on the shelf. And it's not because it doesn't work, and it's not because it's not technically brilliant. It's because there are other obstacles, social, political, legal, economic, that actually stand in the way. And that unless we finish the analysis and start to think about how to deploy these sorts of things in the real world, we're really going to have problems, uh, both in terms of generating it, but just 
creating the consumer confidence that the systems are going to work the way we thought, that in fact that we understand how all that's going to follow. And in fact, the two systems, and we'll talk about this some of my breakout section on the first one is about autonomous vehicles, and the other one is about medical devices. Um, one of the things that uh, Ed mentioned is that, as everyone here probably has seen the videos, you know, you can sit in the passenger seat of a Jeep and, and put on the brakes, and you can do it from the side of the road. These things, systems were not built with security uh, from the basics, and then you can stop a pacemaker, and they're all wireless connected, and they're all insecure. Now, that's the easy part, oddly enough. The problem is, is okay, let's make them secure. There is an arbitrary amount of security you can build in. In fact, you know, but you really need some sort of metric to create a design requirement here, because otherwise, OK, the cycle tax is always worth paying, because of course, you have to make all these devices secure. But the security community knows there's no such thing as a perfectly secure device. So one of the most interesting things, I was talking at a retailing conference right after the Target and Home Depot breaches. And they wanted to know, what can I do to make it 100% secure? I'm willing to spend just about anything to make it 100% secure. And the answer is, you can't. And so we have to adapt the way people think in this space and to try to provide usable metrics so that the answer isn't that essentially you become an insurer to the rest of the world for any faults that you have in the technology you provide. And that, in fact, law provides those answers. And that, in fact, they are, when um, the question was asked earlier, is like, who should decide? Who, who should be responsible for different aspects? In many ways, the allocation of liability is the answer to that question. It's who gets sued, who loses, and who gets to stroke a check at the end of the day. Is it the user and the responsibility they did? Is it uh, the person who built things on the platform? Is it the designer themselves? So what, how can we turn these into real design requirements? And the real standard for me comes out of an area of law called tort law, which is about defective products. In fact, this is called products liability. And we have standards for asking ourselves, when is a product defective? Now, there's two, the easy answer to this is the standard uh, analysis that courts use as a risk utility calculus, which is you look at whether an additional protective measure the costs of that would exceed or fall short of the reasonably foreseeable benefits of implementing that measure. In other words, if there's a cheap thing that would make everything a lot safer, do it. And the way you provide people the incentive to do it is you hold them liable for not doing it. On the other hand, implicit in this is the notion that there may be some things you could do to make it safer. But the costs of doing it are so high or the benefits of doing it are relatively so low that you're not going to hold the product manufacturer responsible for doing that. Now that's the easy part. The kicker is the way that fact determination is, ma the determination is made is in litigation after the fact, in which you have an enormous problem of hindsight bias. Okay, um, the target breach or the OPM breach. Well, obviously these people should have done X, Y, and Z. Well, that's very easy to see after the fact, and there's a tendency to assume that that was all reasonably foreseeable, even if it was a one in a hundred shot or even less, you know, five nines shot reliability is still going to come up in a large population a discrete number of times. I think about this in terms of uh, vaccines, all those debates. There is a discernible number of people who will develop the disease from vaccines. And they're still worth doing in the public health from the risk utility calculus. But after the fact, a post hoc decision maker will be overwhelmingly determined, uh, inclined to actually find liability. And that's a problem because what you risk doing is turning the producers of products into basically insurance companies for any flaws that result. And so, in fact, implementing this properly has a great deal of uncertainty about it, but is, is very, very important to people who design products. Um, there's another question about which is the robustness of design, which is not just is there a risk utility calculus, but what contingencies do you have to plan for? So for, the easiest thing for me to think about is autonomous vehicles. Okay, um, we can deal with this can be working in an uncertain environment. How much weather volatility do you have to account for? I mean, we all know there's going to be rainy days, routine rainy days. That's fine. We have 100-year floods. We have 300-year floods. We have La Deluge. And the answer is we could force designers to anticipate all of those possibilities and design them in and responsibly uh, make it taken in, into account. But almost all these things only work in a narrow range of parameters. And by expanding it, you're just making it make it harder. And for uncertain benefits, that'll be minimal. It reminds me when they talked about New Orleans, they designed it for the 100-year flood and the levees. It obviously got destroyed. They're not talking about the 300-year flood. You can do that. You'll just have very tall levees, very expensive things that won't get used very often. And people are asking, maybe it's just better to rebuild New Orleans every 100 years. And that's actually a valid way to think about it, which is you know, there is a cost-benefit calculus, because the reality is if you put too much liability, the product just disappears. 
And the question then becomes, is that a good outcome? Now, the other thing that's about this is also the robustness problem is it's not just uh, environmental stuff, it's other drivers, all of whom won't necessarily be using the same uh, autonomous system, some of them will be self-directed, and in fact, as we all know, the vast majority of problems happen with, this, with user error. And so the question is how are you going to allocate those responsibilities and how much variance are you really requiring the product designer to account for? And that's a huge problem. Um, the, there's another problem which happens in systems, which is, in fact, uh, many, th uh, many phenomena are the result of interactions, and you have to assign a responsibility and causation to them. And for all the reasons we talked about the difficulties of causation, and in fact, what you really have in many cases is a problem of joint causation, which law has ways of dealing with, but it's very co can be very difficult. And this isn't just about product design. Security is very clearly going to be part of the mix as part of what an effective product is. In fact, as Ed mentioned, one of the things that the FTC is enforcing under a fairly controversial aspect of their authority, which is on unfair trade practices. Now, he said correctly that the FTC primarily holds people to their promises. If you say you're going to do something, that, you know, then you should be held to that. You created the expectations. That's a deceptive practice. Unfair practices are, are more complicated. It's not something you did it's some, against some external standard, not one that you created yourself. They are now holding companies liable for failure to provide sufficient security as an unfair trade practice. And the problem there is, is that we've had uh, a difficulty determining what that metric is because it's unfolding over time and actually not through law but through settlements and the consent decrees that are actually, uh, you have to read through a lot of them and cobble them together. The point I'm making is this is an interesting question here. Security is, uh, an adequate level of security without question is something, uh, a liability question that companies are going to face at a minimum from the FTC but also in my opinion from private product suits from individual consumers. Uh, to provide an example, just uh, to, this is a, uh, a NIST criterion in autonomous vehicles to show how this plays out. It's not just autonomous vehicles writ simple. We have different classes of autonomous vehicles. Some, zero is not automated at all. Four is fully self-driving. Three is self-driving like on autopilot until you fairly elaborately take it off autopilot. But in between you have these different things where you have some automated systems. You know, this is, can be as simple as my door is now locked when I hit 10 miles an hour. That's a simple, independent, automated system, fairly uncontroversial, that they unlock when I put it in park. Third, the intermediate level is where, in fact, the functions start to combine and interact with each other. And as we all know, we have all these problems validating software systems, you know, in all these different states they operate when this happens. And you can see that we should need to think about this not just as a single phenomenon, but to start to map some of these aspects about how liability would play out into these different worlds in ways that I think require some thinking about. And it's not, it's going to apply differently to different kinds of systems. Now, what's interesting is, <laughs> There are actually, the benefit of the risk utility calculus in security is it actually gives potentially the metric for security designers to answer that question, how much more security do I need to provide? Because it can't be infinite and it can't be more because it's always more. So it actually provides a way to say when is enough. If you can quantify the risks, and that is an enormous problem here in terms of how we do things, but, and, uh, and uh, again, with the hindsight bias problems. But again, we have a problem in, in quantifying the risk. Security is an emergent phenomenon, almost only appears at scale with the interactions of individual subsystems. We're not talking about a single design system. We're often talking about ad hoc systems that are operating in a very you know, independent manner, which interact in ways that are quite uh, un uh, unpredictable. We have the joint causation problems, which I talked about. And in fact, there is an irreducible amount of this risk. If I have time, I'll talk about the system we're using. But in fact, what they will talk about is systems that are robust against a fairly general set of risks, of attacks. But there is no such thing as a system that is robust against all sorts of attacks. And in fact, uh, I think that what I'll tell, something I'll say in a minute, I think it's actually very important to feed back into the system of law a change in the way we think about things and the fact that they have to understand that there's no perfection out there. So among my many uh, sins in the world, um, I used to work in uh, for product, consumer products and my wife did as well. She worked for General Mills and one of her products was Lucky Charms. And they actually had something they called Lucky's Birthday and they wanted to put a microwavable birthday cake in it as a premium which the kids really liked and the lawyer said, um, we have instructions, we want you to show us, a, uh, you want to prove to us that even if you microwave this cake an arbitrary amount of time, it will never catch on fire. <laughs> and the answer is, if you, if you microwave anything except water for an arbitrary amount of time, it will eventually catch on fire. And water will do other nasty things, but that's a different matter. But the thing is that 
That sort of mentality is very easy for us to lapse into. It's the same thing that the retailers wanted. Perfect security. What do I have to do? And this is motivated by the, all the right motives. They're conscientious, trying to do the right things. But from a person who's really designing technology, that's not an answer. And so, in fact, we have to think about things in ways that's going to work back and forth on both sides. Now, there is a way we can get out of this. Now, the problem is the cost, the risk utility calculus is indeterminate. You can't find, it's very difficult to determine it in advance. And that, in fact, you're going to see that there's a huge hindsight bias. There is a potential bailout, which is interesting. If an area is highly regulated, it displaces products liability law. That compliance with the regulation is, this is an, an idea called preemption, is that, in fact, the regulatory regime occupies the entire field, and that, in fact, the right solution is, is to go change the regulations as opposed to suing in court. And that's what's supposed to create the right incentives. There's a whole literature on which is the better way to go, and they all have different distortions. What's interesting is we have to do the exercise to figure out where this has some possibilities, because this would make the business people very happy, because then they can do the certain things and they know they're fine, and would help the technologists, so they can understand what they have to design to, giving a clear standard, instead of this after-the-fact test that's going to be uh, determined by a court. Um, the reality is medical devices is, broad, is subject to broad preemption, autonomous vehicles almost certainly not. And so there's a whole calculus that goes on here. So the other thing that really is highlighted by the legal side that I think is very interesting is, in fact, is the need to uh, contain, retain, collect and retain reliable data for forensic purposes. So there's a law, there's a part of the law in economics called contractability, which is you can't write a real contract. You can't really hold someone accountable, get liability, unless something is both visible and verifiable. Um, they seem like they're the same thing. If it's invisible, but definitely not verifiable, but there, there are some things that fall in the, in the category that are visible but not verifiable. The classic thing is effort uh, in by an employee. Usually the employee knows they're shirking. Usually the boss knows they're shirking, but they have a del devil of a time proving it up in court. And so one of the th interesting things is you can suspect, for example, you have a service level agreement where you're putting your packets out into the world and you really have an understanding of what they're supposed to do with it. And you may have some emergent sense that they're not entirely honoring their service level agreement, but your ability to actually verify, certainly on a packet level basis, just isn't in the architecture. And what's fascinating to me is that we have to think about these things in a CPS security wor a privacy world. If something goes wrong, in a distributed CPS system, you have to have the, mech the data existing to prove who screwed up, who didn't honor or didn't design their, thing, their, their uh, component properly. And not only that, you have to do this in an environment where people have the incentives to lie, cheat, and tamper with everything. In fact, think Volkswagen. I mean, that's the great example, which is, and it takes a long time to figure this stuff out. And so there are systems here that we have to create for forensic data, but we have to take tremendous control, uh, ability to verify that that's happened. We have to put systems in place that does that. Not only that, um, it used to be if you were only using, say, heart monitoring data or location data off a car on a dynamic basis, you could use it, discard it. Your privacy overhanging liability is very small. If you have to hang on to it for extended periods of time to actually verify uh, mistakes after the fact, your potential privacy liability is very large. And what we'll also know, anyone who studies in this field, is that privacy uh, liability here is not unified in the U.S. In fact, we have ad hoc regimes governed by different sta uh, statutes. Jim Waldo, um, in his uh, abstract, generously calls it um, obscure, which is a very nice way to say it. But it's, it's a mess. And in fact, it's a mess for uh, even the people who teach it. Um, that's what I said about forensic data. Now, so one of the things that I think is really exciting about this is that, in fact, um, if we do this well, we can actually start to give technologists the design requirements they need, both in terms of the products themselves, but also in terms of the security and the privacy, to determine how much is going to happen. But in fact, we need to quantify this. And um, what, one of the things, if I, uh, when I get to that, one of the things that they're going to talk about is, yes, we can recover from faults, but you know, they can bound it. And they can give other, uh, so one of the examples I'll give is differential privacy. We can actually talk about what the value of the signal is, how much noise we can introduce. And we can actually put bounds around it in ways that people can rely on, understand what their other components can understand what they're engineering to. And that, in fact, we can also use those same quantification aspects to determine where the liability falls. Um, and in fact, what we see is we see some avenues from the law for safe harbors. We actually see the importance of, act of uh, forensic data and verifying after the fact. And in fact, I do think that we have a chance to feed this back in. 
Now, I'm going to actually put up a few slides which are, are a bit risky for me because we're going to start talking about the technical aspects of it. I am the lawyer on the team. Um, I will try to do them justice, but I'm using it primarily to show you that, in fact, how hard it is to quantify all these things and what the nature of the risks uh, really are in this space. So um, the, the solution that the, N the NSF team that I'm working on is working towards, uh, and this is uh, for about the examples, as I said, are autonomous vehicles and medical systems, is, uh, involves basically fast detection, fast remediation on the assumption that you know, no, nothing is perfect, so you have to assume a certain amount of successful tax into the system, and the question is how do you respond to those? So the first is prevention. You do, they have a lightweight encryption system that's built on use of, of encryption libraries, but what they really want to do, what's missing from that is a secure channel to try to make that better. The detection builds on the accountability lit the literature that uh, other people have been developing, really looking at um, trying to find, the, so these distributed systems have nodes, they actually monitor the state of the other nodes, they try to see if they're outside normal parameters to identify situations that are outside. And this is generally considered to be robust against a fairly general number of, a, a, a level of attacks. Now, to say that you're looking at state parameters and verifying they're within certain bounds doesn't mean you're going to identify every attack. I mean, snooky attacks are going to be able to stay within those bounds. You're not going to catch those. Again, this is the perfection myth that I'm fighting, which is if you're going to hold them liable for every successful attack, simply put, you're not going to get these systems. You can't. And uh, there's a tendency to see a big company. They must have a lot of money, and we, and we tend to criticize them that way. Um, the thing that's missing from that literature is a timing guarantee about how fast the detection is going to occur. And in fact, um, the idea is what they're doing here is making it uh, tractable in terms of the information done. And so in fact, what they're doing is not a general solution about the, uh, the state being monitored, but it's actually going to be control aware and event aware and actually make it really try to, to reduce the cycle tax and all the other aspects up to make that go. But again, the purpose here of detection is not going to be, we're not going to get it all. And insisting a system get it all is probably setting it up to essentially not exist. So the second part of the, the team is working on mitigation, another step is mitigation recovery. As you know, there's a literature on fault tolerant control systems. If there's a bug in your system, you don't just stop and take it down and fix it. Is how do we fix this stuff still operational on the fly? And what they'll say is they, uh, these systems can tolerate faults up to a point. If there's enough of a tax corrupts enough of the system, these fault tolerant systems cease to work properly. And again, we have to have some notion of the environment you're working in. You, nothing works absolutely. You've got to parameterize all this stuff. And that, in fact, there is a, the, the part of the project that we're going to be working on is to bound the time the recovery happens. In fact, right now, there isn't a time parameter on that. And that's a quantification that engineers need to make that work. We're working on forensics. This right now isn't very synchronous in the existing world. It's not very compact. We're trying to find ways to do it. And the point I'm making here is these things are all, to me, can follow very naturally out of the legal analysis about how much protection you need to do, get a quantification on the risks, allow people to make intelligent trade-offs based on the likely liability outcomes about how much you're going to design in, how short do those time horizons have to be. But again, we have a problem here about integrating systems and collective risk, which is, in fact, as we know, we can design all these systems, they run great in the lab, and you put them up at scale, and boom, we have problems. And so we have to have the system, the legal liability system, adapt to take all of that into account. That is the best I can do to kind of give you a flavor of the kinds of ways I think that better engagement with the legal regime might actually help this. And uh, I'm all in on this. Right now, I'm in the process of creating uh, a series, my, the final of a series of four joint degree programs uh, between law and engineering. Because I have devoted a significant portion and will continue to devote a significant proportion of my life to the idea that we need to be training a different kind of professional with, tra uh, with expertise in both disciplines. That's it. We probably have time for a question or two.
So it's interesting when you say we need to design products people need. I mean, the flip side of this is, I mean, to step back, this is a perpetual flaw purely from the computer science side, is that um, I see so many IT departments design products without actually talking to the users who are going to need them, and it drives me crazy. And there's a wonderful theory by Clayton Christensen in the business school here called disruptive innovation, which is uh, which all of us technophiles are really uh, danger of falling into. And most people don't understand this properly. What he says is we fall the Companies follow the leading edge of the technology above what consumers actually need. They over-engineer them. They create an opportunity for a low-cost, low-quality, well, lesser technically inferior, technically inferior competitor to take the market away from them. So, I mean, I do think we need to keep our eye on what customers actually need. Um, I, the other, the, the, the funny thing that, um, the other reaction I have before I get to answer your specific question is, no one ever bought a product because of the security it provided. And that, in fact, product designers think of this as a cost center, and they'll do what they're supposed to do, but they want to spend most of their cycles and their time and their effort to designing features that student, people actually need. And so the funny thing is we have to get adequate security, but we have to understand this isn't a filter, that this is in supporting real needs on top of that. What can we do to make sure that it's tested before it released? Um, I think product liability is a huge aspect to do this. I think um, even setting aside this, business practices will set up reasonable baselines. We can actually do things in the technical community that will help the legal process, because legal process is not going to be experts and has the hindsight bias problems I have. The bigger problem actually is post-release problems. You know, as you find out about what is your duty to disclose, what is your duty to remediate, and uh, that actually is, I think, a more complicated problem than the one about ex ante stuff, because then there are good faith arguments about why you should do it. You should have a certain window to remediate it before and patch it before you release flaws to the world. But there's no question that there needs to be a dialogue. But I actually think law has an important is is the business end of that dialogue because it determines who strokes a check at the end of the day. And the issue goes on throughout everything you say. I agree. Airbags save, I don't know, tens or hundreds of thousands of lives, but killed a few people, right, probably. So these kinds of things are going to be incredibly difficult. Can the law fix this, or is this fundamentally going to be a gigantic problem for the political system to deal with rapidity of innovation like Uber versus thoughtful deliberation on the effect of medallion owners and Uh, the, or are we going to be able to power through this sort of rapidly? That's an interesting question. I would say yes and yes in a terrible, in a terrible way. Um, I, I want to quibble one thing about your, uh, your terminology. And uh, the way I would use the, the words is a little bit different. The way an economist thinks about this is the objective function is what descriptively describes people's behavior. What does a company trying to, you know, a company's trying to maximize profits. And if you want to predict its behavior, you look at that. That's its objective. What I think you're talking about is what an economist would call a welfare function, which is you look at what the equilibrium resulting from people maximizing their objectives. And then you see whether that leads to a good outcome or not. Now, the risk utility calculus has embedded in it an economic wealth maximization utility function. And the idea is that trade-off is cost-benefit analysis. And it's hard. Um, it does not deal well with issues like fairness. And in fact, uh, that has always been outside the province of that. And in fact, we would have to re-engineer this system to deal with issues about fairness. And so I would say this is, it sets, it sets as its goal economics, without question. But what I would say is, um, what many people think is, there used to be a conceit in law that if there's a problem out there, well, the law should go in and fix it. Um, what we now realize is the legal fix is imperfect just as the, the non-legal fix is. And we need to look, we need to be humble about the actual remedies. And what we're learning is the better remedies are not heavy-handed 
ones, but rather trying to tweak the incentives of people's objective functions to nudge them towards what we want them to do, is that they tend to be much, much more successful. And so what I would say here is that does law have something to do with this? Absolutely. We have, it, law will come to an outcome in cases, and will reflect something. And in fact, it will play out the calculus I'm talking about. On the other hand, the law in the trails politics a little bit slowly, but eventually it is a political decision. So I'll give you a really easy example. Ultralight aircraft were litigated out of existence by tort liability. And John Denver died in Willem. These are essentially hang gliders with a you know, lawnmower attached to it. And it's just, you know, it's just they're, they're really dangerous things. We now have legislation. We have this with vaccines, too, that says, if you want to take the chance, go ahead. You don't, just be aware, you're not going to recover a dime from anybody because you're doing this. And we see this with, we strike the balance with many, many different things. There are extremely risky activities that have no real social benefit that we make the user bear entirely. There's extremely risky activities that have extreme social benefit that we find a different way. I'm blasting. If you use explosive, you are liable, but we let you do it because there's value in the world. And this sort of, what we'll do is, we'll, and if you maintain a wild animal and hurt someone, it's on you. I mean, it's... All these, unless it's in the zoo, in which case we don't. I mean, there's all these different, and there's different rules that we do based on this sort of situational contextual risk utility calculus, which reflects the political decisions we make and are always subject to being overruled by legislators.